go straight into with Red. Red is talking about uh, a VR project he did, uh, digitizing history and culture with FOSS. So I'm just going to hand it straight over to Red. Please join me in welcoming him with a round of applause. Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, so my name is Red. I'm a PhD student at UNSW. And my talk's going to be on um, digitizing history and culture um, and how uh, free and open source software uh, kind of helped out a little bit um, with, the, with the development. Um, so uh, I'll really be dividing my talk uh, just into two small sections. Uh, first, I'll just be talking about the VR project uh, that I was working on at UNSW. And then I'll talk a little bit about how um, FOSS played a role in my project and um, my interest in game development in general. So, um, yep, just those two sections. So, um, the, the name of the game is called Torres Strait Virtual Reality. Um, so, it's about uh, the culture and the knowledge in the Torres Strait Islands. So, where are the Torres Strait Islands? Um, they're located between uh, Cape York in far north Queensland and Papua New Guinea. So, there's a whole collection of islands in between there. Um, just a little bit about the islands. Uh, we're, we're a big exporter of things like crayfish, betch de mer, which is uh, sea cucumber, and um, some other, other sorts of uh, seafood there. Um, but it, like I said, essentially the game, it's a virtual reality game, and it's teaching about Torres Strait Islander um, culture and knowledge. So how did the idea start? Um, so I'm, I'm a Torres Strait Islander. Um, so I had a little bit of knowledge um, from being ra raised in the culture. But I also relied uh, a lot on what my family knew as well. So my dad was contributing uh, a lot and putting a lot of knowledge into the game as well. Um, we also relied on our own research, so looking at different uh, books, story books, um, uh, law books as well, uh, looking at things on the internet, and also uh, academic articles as well. Um, so we started off with the knowledge. Um, and we also found that not really anyone had done that much uh, about the Torres Strait Islands. So I know there's been a bit done by, uh, in terms of like Aboriginal stuff, um, but there really wasn't that much in, out there in terms of Torres Strait Islander digital media and digital entertainment. Um, so there was kind of a little bit of a gap for us to uh, fill in there. Um, kind of another big aspect to the game is the uh, astronomy, and it's also kind of another aspect to Torres Strait Islander culture. And I thought the astronomy part fit really well with virtual reality because both sorts, both of these things are kind of very visual sort of things. So when you look up at the stars and you see them moving across the sky, you see a constellation. Um, it fits really well uh, with VR because you're putting it on and you're, you're looking up and you're seeing it uh, almost, not, not quite, but something like the real thing, hopefully. Um, it also fit the technology in terms of uh, virtual reality uh, fit really well with uh, the culture as well. So at least within the Torres Strait Islands, um, the way that we kind of pass down knowledge is traditionally in kind of a verbal and a visual way. Um, you're showing something or you're telling something. Um, and I think that fits really well uh, with the virtual reality technology as well because you're getting a, a very heavy visual input, but you're also getting auditory input as well. Um, so I thought that fit quite, quite nice. Um, and like I said, um, and virtual reality uh, is, of course, you, a lot of you probably know, it's kind of, it's a rising trend lately. Uh, it's becoming more accessible, um, and it's a lot more cheaper to get as well. Uh, so this is kind of another reason that we started on it. Uh, and also another thing is uh, I had the capability and the skill set to do it. And this is important for uh, FOSS as well, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. So really, with all these different things combined, um, we felt there was an opportunity for Torres Strait Islander culture and knowledge to tra transition from its oral form into uh, a more of an interactive uh, and visual experience, uh, kind of simulating uh, some of the understanding and knowledge some Torres Strait Islanders have about their surroundings and their environment. So the outcome of the project, at least so far um, is that we've developed a uh, virtual reality game prototype and we've used it in a few different classes at UNSW. Um, so the first class 
we used it in. Uh, it wasn't necessarily related to the indigenous content, but it was looking at uh, using uh, a game for learning. So the, the class was a serious games class, and it was looking at how, how we can use games to learn about something. And it was also looking at the use of the technology as well, because um, the, the uh, kind of like the assessment that they had to do in the class was for um, CBA. And of course, CBA is really interested in all this sort of uh, new cutting edge sort of stuff. So it was kind of a good example to use it uh, there for when they're making their own game or they're making their own kind of prototype. Um, and we also were able to use the game in a, um, we were able to use it in an environmental policy class. Uh, and the angle that they took uh, on the game for this class is um, kind of looking at how, how elements of the game worked into native title. So at least from my understanding, native title is really just um, to facilitate uh, cultural practices that indigenous people have had in the past. So in the game, um, you're kind of going on this uh, cultural journey to collect all these different things for a festivity that's happening. So you're going up north to trade with Papua New Guineans to get drums, mats and spears. And then you're also going around to Kai Reef uh, to hunt dugong and turtle. Uh, and the way that they looked at the game was looking at things like the treaty to facilitate the trade uh, between Torres Strait, and, uh, Torres Strait Islanders and Papua New Guineans. Uh, and then things like hunting rights, so for the dugong and turtle, for the feasting later. So that's kind of the, the angle that they took on, on that game, uh, using that game and trying integrating that into the, the content. Um, and we're also hoping to use it in an Indigenous Studies class. Um, there's a substantial marine component to the game as well. So I think marine science might be interested in looking at it as well. Um, so yeah, we've, the outcome there is that we've used it in a, a few different classes at university, and we're looking at a few others as well. Um, we've also showcased the game at uh, several conferences and forums, and we've got um, some good feedback from there as well. And a really good side, pro um, side product that was kind of unexpected um, from the game is that it, we've been able to use it as a, uh, a tool to encourage Indigenous adolescents to get interested in STEM uh, and the possibility of going down uh, a technology path uh, at university. So typically you find that uh, a lot of um, Indigenous typically find that a lot of indigenous people at university will go down things like, will go down part, career paths like education or um, law. Health is another big one as well, but no one really goes into STEM. So as a side product, we were able to use this as an oppor uh, opportunity to show what you can do in STEM and uh, kind of how you can represent your culture there as well. So um, what are the benefits? Uh, to using the game or using the virtual reality medium. Well, you're learning through a uh, cutting edge and immersive medium. Uh, in the game, you would learn about the uh, unique Torres Strait Islander people uh, and culture and knowledge. Uh, that's not typically out there or not that well known. Um, you're learning through play when you're playing in the class and you're experiencing a, an oral uh, culture and knowledge system in a digitized form. So um, what might you find or what might you learn if you were to play the game? So uh, like I mentioned before, um, you can learn about the cultural practices in the Torres Strait. So things like hunting dugong and turtle, uh, trade with the Papua New Guineans. Um, another kind of element in, in the game that I've put there is uh, things about animal life cycles and seasonal life cycles. Um, so when certain animals are breeding, uh, or when they're in a particular area, or when certain plants or fruits are growing and when you have to harvest them. Um, and this element kind of works into the astronomy as well, because um, the way that some Torres Strait Islanders have kind of understood when to, to plant and so, like to sow and uh, harvest certain things is based on the movement of constellations in the sky. So as the constellations in the sky move, uh, move across the sky, uh, you'll know that certain animals are breeding, or you can get certain eggs from uh, certain animals, or you can harvest certain fruits and plants. Um, and so that's kind of where it works into that. But then the astronomy is represented uh, sometimes as 
different animals that you see in the sky. So um, you might have Baidim the shark who's in the north and then you'll have a warrior who's represented in the south. Uh, and sometimes these constellations have their own stories as well. Um, so these, the environmental knowledge interlinks with the astronomy, which also interlinks with some of the stories and myths that are told in the Torres Strait as well. Uh, so there's a couple of different levels there. However, um, they go through and the player doesn't learn all of that. That's fine as well. That's, that's okay. I, I'm not expecting everyone to pick it up. But just as you understand that Torres Strait Islanders have their own knowledge system and their own culture, and it kind of interlinks at different levels, um, that's, a, that's a good thing to take away from the game. All right, so just a disclaimer. Um, technically, the software that I used was not quite fully free and open source software. Um, it's Unreal Engine 4. Uh, I, think you can edit the, I think you can edit the program, and you can obviously download it for free. Um, and you can create uh, content uh, from, the, from Unreal Engine 4 and then redistribute that. But I don't think you can edit the program itself and then redistribute it and then uh, give it away uh, in, that way, in that sense. They so start charging you when you start making money. Yeah, exactly. So perhaps the thing that I used more was more of something akin to freeware. But I would definitely say that uh, the free and open source software values and philosophies of freedom of access, uh, use, uh, modify, or rather to create the content and then redistribute that particular content that you've created uh, was fundamental to the project, to success, and to my interest in game development. So um, uh, what role did uh, free and open source software play in the project? Um, well, it let me learn the program initially. Uh, they let me learn the program initially. Um, so really, I was able to access the, the software with uh, no cost. And uh, there were obviously free, free tutorials online as well. Um, and I feel that's quite important as well. Uh, if there had been that initial financial barrier there to begin with, um, I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, I know it's probably not that much in, if you look at something like Unity. Um, but if I had known that there wasn't a cost attached, I, I probably wouldn't have gone past that first thing because I didn't know whether I was going to like it or I didn't know that it was going to be successful or where it was going to go. Where with the, with the cost removed, really the only thing that I really lost was time and even then I would have still learned something. So I think having the no cost there was a really good, um, really helped the, me get into the, um, get into game development and see what I actually could and I couldn't do. Um, so that was the, that's the next point. Um, once I got on there, I could start playing around with the program and I could find out what was and what isn't achievable. And it really clarified my vision uh, for what I could do in the game and kind of the direction I wanted to take the project in as well. Uh, like I said, it developed my uh, interest in game development as well. Um, so I had liked games and I had liked playing games. Uh, and I was even doing a PhD studying video games as well in history. Um, but uh, until I actually got into the program, uh, it was, I didn't really have an interest in game development or creating worlds or doing these sorts of things. Um, so having that barrier removed, I was able to get in there and see what it's about. Uh, and that really sparked my interest in it. Um, having uh, access to the program and being able to learn it really helped uh, develop my expertise at university. So um, if somebody needs something developed there, uh, I can always help out with that. And it's also created a source of income for me as well. So I actually tutor um, in, uh, it's like a whole combination of software teaching courses uh, at, at UNSW. So uh, I do teach there as well. So that's created a source of income for me uh, to get me through my PhD. Um, the other cool thing is it's allowed me to pass on my knowledge to my own students as well, uh, so they can access the um, they can access the software for free as well, um, and that in turn has helped me uh, train up. Well, it's allowed me to teach my students and train up people for my own project as well, uh, um, and expand and expedite my project. It's also reduced costs as well. So. Um, with this, uh, I just want to say, I want to say there's opportunities to tell many stories and histories with virtual reality, not just Torres Strait Islander history and culture. Um, and I think there's opportunities for us to use virtual reality 
uh, to teach history and culture uh, in ways that we couldn't have before because it's more interactive. Uh, and it, games in general have been typically over, been overlooked at university. So I really think there's an opportunity there to, for us to take advantage of. Uh, and there's opportunities for us to use games in multiple ways. Um, uh, one game in multiple ways in different courses, kind of like we, um, I did with the game here. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I, to try and interlink uh, FOSS and kind of my project together, uh, my dad kind of sees culture as a tree. Um, so you, at the bottom you have these roots, which is kind of the traditional knowledge, but then we have these branches that come out and they kind of represent the new forms of uh, expression of a culture and history. Um, and I would say that FOSS kind of, if it, if it was a tree, it would be like a fertilizer or a nourishment because it um, allowed and fostered the new branches or the new forms of medium uh, to come out and express uh, culture in, and history in different forms. Um, so I guess that's my talk. I just want to thank uh, UNSW, uh, my team who helped me, um, other contributors to the project, uh, organizers of Miniconf and the Torres Strait people as well. Um, and yep, yeah, and I'll maybe show you a trailer of what we've got. So, um, 